Hello, good evening, everybody. So I'm Heidi Arola. I'm the Director of Global Partnerships at Purdue University, and I'm also the Director of the Purdue India Partnership. So many of you might not have known that such a thing existed. Purdue is one of the very few US universities that has a dedicated Purdue India Partnership, or a dedicated India Partnership. So we're very proud of that, and I'll mention a few details about it. So it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you this evening in Mumbai. This is the second time that we have hosted a lecture series in which we've combined new incoming students with alumni. And we found that to be a really great combination because I think it allows you the opportunity to, first of all, meet some students who've gone through Purdue and get their experiences during the dinner that will follow. But I think for you new prospective students and parents, this is also a taste of the sort of intellectual environment that you or your child will be you know, immersed in at Purdue University. These are the kinds of discussions that they'll have the opportunity to take part in um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So a little bit about the India-Purdue partnership. So the partnership has been going strong for about a decade and Purdue is currently home to around 3,000 Indian students and hundreds of faculty of Indian origin. So furthermore, um, Purdue has one of the largest numbers of Indian undergraduate students in the whole United States. And for the first time ever in fall 2022, Indian students became the number one population of all international students at Purdue University. Now that's a big deal because Purdue is always in the top 10 out of more than 4,500 US institutions in terms of international student enrollment. So those of you who went to Purdue previously can attest, those alums in the room, that even though you might land in Chicago and drive two hours through cornfields and now big windmill farms, you arrive in a very cosmopolitan setting at Purdue University with people from more than 130 different countries, but a sizable population of Indian students. So we do have a long history of welcoming Indian students to uh, Purdue University that began in the 1950s and even before that. In fact, today's series is in honor of one such alumnus, Professor C.N.R. Rao. Bharat Ratna, Professor Rao, was a PhD student in chemistry at Purdue, completing his doctorate in 1958, in a record two years and nine months. Professor Rao went on to have a prolific academic career, including serving as a two-time scientific advisor to the Prime Minister of India. He founded and currently works at JNCASR in the International Center for Material Science, and we're proud to have him as a member of our Purdue India Executive Council and to honor him throughout this series. And I'd also like to mention that we have several members of our Purdue India Executive Council present here today. If you wouldn't mind just standing in, in the back, um, Mr. Ajay Marawala is somewhere here as well. So we're very proud that they are still here, that they join us, and that they're part of our advisory board for the Purdue uh, India Initiative. I do want to mention that today's event would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. So on behalf of the whole university community, I would like to convey my deep gratitude to our platinum sponsors, Dr. Reddy's Laboratories, and our alum co-chair, and Managing Director G.V. Prasad, G.V.K., and our alum Vice Chairman Sanjay Reddy, TVS, and our alum Chairman Emeritus Venus Rinivasan, and SMT, and our alum Managing Director Bhargav Kotadia. I would also like to thank our black and gold sponsors, Purdue Alumni Indian Network, DCM Shriram Industries, and our alum Joint President uh, Rudra Shriram, and Purdue for Life. So each year we have a different theme for our series, and this year a theme is a new era of semiconductor electronics. And we're honored to have with us here today Dr. Mark Lundstrom, a world-renowned expert in the field of semiconductors. And also, just so you know, I was a liberal arts major, and you might be thinking to yourself, 
I'm going to sit through a talk for the next you know, 45 minutes or so on semiconductors, and I'm going to be completely lost. But I want to guarantee you that that's not the case. You will find it fascinating, and I'm certain that you will learn something just like I did. Uh, so uh, without further ado, um, actually first I want to just mention the run of show. So Dr. Lundstrom will be pro providing a keynote talk and then we'll transition to a panel discussion because we're also very pleased to have here with us today Professor Vijay Raghunathan. And, and I will moderate that discussion and you will have the opportunity to ask questions, so please do be thinking of those. All right, so Mark Lundstrom serves as Senior Advisor to the President and Chief Semiconductor Officer for Purdue University. He is also the Don and Carol Cyphers Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, a Senior Research Fellow for the Kroc Institute for Deck Diplomacy at Purdue, and has served twice in recent years as Dean of Engineering. In fact, he just finished his last stint as Dean on Saturday, April 1st and flew directly to India. Dr. Lundstrom began his career as an integrated circuit process development and manufacturing engineer and has been at Purdue since 1980, where his research and teaching have focused on the physics, modeling, and simulation of semiconductor devices. He's known best for his work on the scaling limits of MOSFETs, which supported the design and manufacturing of transistors at the 10 nanometer length scale. Beginning in 1995, before the term cloud computing entered the vocabulary, Lundstrom founded NanoHub, which for the past 25 years has offered online access to sophisticated electronic device simulation tools. The NanoHub was also one of the very first to offer open content educational resources and now serves as a global community of more than 2 million annually. Among Lundstrom's recognitions for his career contributions to microelectronics research and education are the Semiconductor Industry Association's University Research Award, the Semiconductor Research Corporation's Aristotle Award, the IEEE's uh, Clado Brunetti Award, and the IEEE's Leon Kirchmeier Graduate Teaching Award. He is a Life Fellow of the IEEE and a Fellow of the APS and the AAAS, lots of acronyms here, and was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. So we're very pleased and honored to have with us here today, Dr. Mark Lundstrom. Well, thank you, Heidi, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great honor to be here giving this lecture as part of this series honoring one of our most famous alumnus, uh, Professor Rao. I'm going to be talking about, let's see if my microphone is working here. We get my microphone straightened up. Oh, I think. All right. Okay, thank you. I'm going to be talking about a topic that I've been working on since my first job out of college almost 50 years ago but there has never been a more exciting or important time in this field and I want to tell you a little bit about what semiconductor electronics is all about and why there's an exciting new era starting and why it presents such great why it's so important to countries and why it presents such tremendous opportunities for young people. <clears throat> okay, um, so I, you know, I, I guess you're all familiar with Purdue, or most of you have been, and you, you've seen some information if you were here for the previous session. Very large college, continuing to grow, very large uh, focus in engineering, some of the highest ranked engineering programs in the country, and uh, one of the things that distinguishes our program is how broad it is, not only students within the state of Indiana, but across the U.S. and across the world. So it's a wonderful place to be. Uh, lots of new activities happening. We're setting up a new campus in Indianapolis. We're reinventing our business college. Lots of new activities in computing and AI and data and in advanced manufacturing. And one of the most important priorities of the university and the nation, and your nation, at this point in time, is semiconductors. And we're getting an awful lot of attention for this uh, during our work at Purdue. And I'm going to try to explain a little bit about 
what this is all about. So this is a book, it, it describes a contest that was run on Reddit, this social network. And the contest asked a question, it said if you took, asked someone, went back to the 1950s and asked that person today, you know, if someone from 1950s suddenly appeared today, you know, what would be the most difficult thing to explain to them? What would be hardest for them to understand? As someone who was uh, born in the 50s, I remember the 50s, right? I know what the 50s were like. The winning answer, you know, for this contest was, I possess in my device, I possess a device in my pocket that is capable of assessing the entirety of information of all humankind. You know, we, we all carry these things around now. And we don't stop and think about how truly amazing they are. And they're amazing because of the chips inside them. It makes, it makes modern life possible. And I think most of us didn't think much about semiconductors. I worked my whole career and, uh, you know, I knew what they were all about, but my family could never understand what is it you work on and, you know, what are these chips? Suddenly during the pandemic, there was a shortage of chips and we realized they're in everything. They're in our smartphones, they're in our laptops, they're in our appliances, they're in our automobiles, and they're really fundamental to modern life. Oh, there was a second part to the winning answer. You know, you, we possess this, we've created these amazing technologies that do these amazing things, and what do we use them for? I use it to look at pictures of cats and get into arguments with strangers. We don't always make the best use of this wonderful technology, but it has shaped the modern world. Well, the first era of electronics really uh, went back to the 1900, the beginning of, of the 20th century, and it lasted quite a long time. In that era, there was a basic device that made all electronics possible, and the device was called the vacuum tube. It was like an electric light bulb. In fact, uh, it, it has a filament. You run current through it, it gets hot, it heats up. It boils electrons off. Uh, there's a plate with a positive voltage that attracts the electrons. And then there's a grid in between, and you can put a voltage on that, and you can control the flow of electrons from the filament to the plate. And, and that way you could amplify devices, useful electronic systems. So this really began when Thomas Edison was tinkering around inventing the electric light and he noticed something was coming off the filament and making the inside of the bulb dark. All right. The physicist Thompson uh, received the Nobel Prize for proving that what was coming off were electrons. Very quickly, uh, a, uh, another physicist in England turned that into a practical device that would allow current to flow one direction but not in another. And then an American, Lee DeForest, put the grid in the middle, and now you could amplify signals by controlling it with the grid. And this was a really big deal. You know, it created, you know, um, it enabled communications, it enabled entertainment. People could sit around in their living rooms and listen to speeches that the president was making or music or whatever. This was a really big deal. And the first electronic computers were made with vacuum tubes. So this is one, it probably ENIAC, made in 1945, probably has, I'm sure, it has a small fraction of the computing power that we all carry around in our pocket today. Uh, it had seven, oh, almost 17,468 vacuum tubes. Uh, it weighed 30 tons. It consumed 150 kilowatts of power. Took a lot of floor space. And 50 vacuum tubes burned out every day, like light bulbs. And there was one person's job, it was to quickly run over and replace the burned out vacuum tube so the computer could keep running. So that was really cutting edge computing technology in 1945. Well, people understood there has to be a better electronic device than these vacuum tubes, which are bulky and consume a lot of power and burn out all the time. And so there was a, there was a large effort underway uh, at many places, but primarily at Bell Telephone Laboratories in, in the U.S. And that led to the invention of the transistor. And the transistor is a complete solid state device, no vacuums, much more reliable. You can see it 
an image of the first one here. Oops, you're not really seeing the print. And you can see, looking at that device, it's hard to predict that that would have transformed life as we know it. And even the inventors had no idea what was in store for them. Down on the bottom, the little piece there that you see labeled germanium, GE, that, that's a germanium crystal. There's some interesting Purdue history here. Uh, Purdue was a hotbed of semiconductor research a decade before the invention of the transistor. The techniques to develop and grow high quality germanium semiconducting crystals and learn how to characterize it and measure it were developed at Purdue and then transferred to Bell Laboratories. So we had a role in the invention of the transistor. All right. So, you know, what is a semiconductor? We should, I should explain what a semiconductor is before we go too much further. You all know what a metal is, and a metal conducts electricity well. You know what an insulator is, like glass. An insulator doesn't conduct electricity very well. A semiconductor is somewhere in between. It conducts some electricity, but not very well. It blocks the flow of current, but doesn't block it very well. You know, so why is it useful? Well, it's useful because if you put a small number of other atoms in a semiconductor, you can control its electronic properties. And you can change it into a metal, or you can change it into an insulator. And that's how we build electronic devices. That ability to be able to control the properties of this material precisely allow us to build transistors. So very quickly, people discovered uses for this new device. It wasn't a direct replacement for transistors. Uh, they were fragile. They, they, they uh, didn't deliver very much power. They didn't work at high frequencies. But people began to discover uses for them, and one of them was in portable electronics. So by 1954, only a few years after the invention of the transistor, we were seeing radios produced. This radio was manufactured in Indianapolis, just 60 miles away from West Lafayette, Purdue. It was the first transistor radio. It wasn't a big commercial success because the quality was sort of low. Um, what was a big commercial success happened a few years later, the Sony shirt pocket radio. So this was a six transistor radio and it was pretty high quality. This was the first uh, portable consumer electronic device. You could carry music around with you. Sony advertised it as the shirt pocket radio. It was so small you could put it in a shirt pocket. You actually couldn't put it in a standard shirt pocket. So he had his salesmen had special shirts that had slightly larger pockets. So when they went around selling radios, they could call them shirt pocket radios. But it was a big hit and it was you know, suddenly transistors had a big market and you could sell products and you could generate profit and you could turn that, plow that back into R&D and you could make more products. Now, I remember this because I was a kid and your friend down the block would get a six transistor radio and then someone on the other block would get an eight transistor radio and that was even better. And then you got a 12 transistor radio and you beat them all. So very quickly, we began to measure the power of an electronic system by the number of transistors in it, the basic building blocks of electronic devices. Now, it wasn't clear that this device was going to change the world yet. For a long time, there was this debate between tubes and, va and uh, uh, vacuum tubes and transistors, and the vacuum tube people were doing the best they could to make vacuum tubes as small as they could. So this is, this is an image here about you know, we can compete with these transistors, we can make really small vacuum tubes. But that didn't last very long. You know, it, it quickly became apparent that the transistor was the future. Now, the transistor in these devices is a different kind of transistor. It's called a silicon MOSFET. So it's made on a different semiconductor called uh, silicon. Um, and silicon is basically highly refined sand, very common, earth abundant. Uh, and you can see that the terminals of the transistor, they have very descriptive names. So the source term, you know, a small number of arsenic atoms have been added to the silicon to change it into a metal and provide a source of electrons. The drain is where the electrons want to flow out 
So very descriptive terms. In between the source and the drain is a gate that opens or closes and allows the electrons to flow from the source to the drain. That's how we make a transistor. And you know, all electronic systems are made possible by devices like that. There's some interesting Purdue history here as well. This device was also first demonstrated at Bell Telephone Laboratories. And it was demonstrated by a Purdue alumnus, John Muhammad Atala, and his co-worker, a Korean-American, Duan Khan. Uh, and he did his PhD at Purdue in 1949, then went to work at Bell Labs, and invented the transistor, which is the dominant device today. And then there was one more thing that, that happened. A lot was happening in the late 1950s or around 1960. And there's one more advance that took place that, that uh, Isaac Asimov had something to say about. So you know, we know who Isaac Asimov is, the famous science fiction writer. I tell people that it's almost impossible to overstate the importance of this technology. But Isaac Asimov might have come pretty close. So he called it the most important moment that mankind, the most important moment since mankind emerged as a life form. And what was that moment? The transistor had already been invented. It wasn't the transistor. It was something called the planar process. Now, what is that? It was a process for manufacturing transistors more efficiently. But very quickly, the year after that, um, Robert Noyce at Fairchild Semiconductor realized that process could be used to build integrated circuit chips. You could build small chips of silicon with more than one transistor and wire it up. That's what made everything possible with chips, that planar process. So this is a silicon wafer. You see it's very thin. It's 300 millimeters in diameter. It's divided up into a number of chips. This goes through a highly sophisticated manufacturing process. Uh, each of those chips is then individually uh, thought up and, and separated. If, if you would look at the cross-section, that's a very thin silicon wafer. If you would look at a cross-section, what, what's in the thickness of it, down on the bottom is the silicon, and up on top you'll see layer upon layer of metal. Because there are many, many transistors and they all have to be wired up in the system in order to produce the computer or whatever it is you're trying to produce. If you look very closely at the bottom, you can see the transistors. And then today you might see 10 levels of metal connecting all of those transistors and making your circuit. So it's an incredibly sophisticated process, probably the most complex things human beings manufacture. And this is the, you know, the famous plot of Moore's Law. What has driven progress since about 19... 60, the invention of the first transistor, is this thing we call Moore's Law. And you know, Moore's Law, you know, we maybe will mark the end of it, or we're getting close to the end of it. Gordon Moore, whose Moore's Law is named after, passed away about a week ago. So what is Moore's Law? So Gordon Moore realized that the first chip had one transistor on it. The second chip which was made only a year later, had two transistors on it. The next chip had four transistors on it. The next chip had eight transistors on it. The next chip had 16 transistors on it. In 1965, Gordon Moore looked at that and said, he predicted this is going to continue for several years. And, and it did. Nobody probably anticipated that it would continue as long. But when you double, at first the numbers are small, but you keep doubling and doubling and doubling and doubling for 40 years, the numbers get enormous, right? So you, get, you end up producing enormous numbers of transistors per chip. Now, this is, this is my first job out of college in 1974. That we thought the technology was pretty sophisticated at that point. So we were, we were measuring the size of the transistor, that gap between the source and the drain. We measured in, in micrometers at that point. Today we would measure, it was a five micrometer process. Today we would measure it in nanometers. So we, called, we would call that a 5,000 nanometer process. That's the gap between the source and the drain. And we could put about 10,000 transistors on the chip. That, that was really pretty sophisticated. But we just kept doubling the number, and it slowed down. Every 18 months, it turned out. Every 18 months, 
the company would figure out how to put twice as many on. Electronics would be twice as powerful. It would be faster, you know, better, and it wouldn't be twice as expensive because there were economies of scale. And if you look today, today's leading edge technology is about nanometers. That's 1,000 times smaller channel length. Just incredible that we've been able to do that so long. The area of the transistor is 1,000 squared times smaller, 1 million times smaller. So we can put 1 million times 10,000 transistors on a chip. Today, a sophisticated leading edge chip has tens of billions of transistors. And some designers have to figure out how to wire up 50 billion transistors and produce the sophisticated chips that power smartphones and things like that. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. So for the last 40 years or so, it's been like a freight train. We knew what we needed to do. We need to make transistors smaller and double the number on a chip. And we keep doing that year after year after year. And everything gets better. And that's what's, that's what's shaped the modern world. But it's gotten really expensive and difficult to do. When, in my first job, you know, many companies were, were producing their own chips. But as it became harder and harder and more and more expensive, fewer and fewer companies were able to stay in the game. So this is a tool that is used to produce those small patterns that produce the source and the drain and the gate. In my first job, the corresponding tool cost $25,000. This tool costs over $150 million. Just one tool inside a factory producing the chips. And for that reason, because it has become so expensive and so sophisticated, there are only three companies in the world that produce leading edge chips. Intel, TSMC in Taiwan, and Samsung in Korea. Right? It's just unbelievably. But you know, one of the things that is happening is it Moore's law is actually slowing because it's just getting harder and harder to make transistors smaller. They're so small right now that you can count the number of atoms in every transistor. And it's getting very difficult. So progress is slowing. But most of you probably, you're probably not aware of a slowdown in progress. Things seem to be just, your electronic devices seem to be getting better and better. How is that happening? Well, one of the main reasons that it's happening is that more and more companies are deciding that they need to design their own chips. If you take a generic microprocessor chip, for many years, a few companies produced these generic chips, and then other companies would program and put them in their products and use them. But if you can design the chip to do exactly what you want it needed to do in your product, it can be much more efficient. And that's why companies like Apple design their own chips for their laptops and other, other products. So Apple is designing some very sophisticated chips these days. You know, 67 billion transistors on this M2 chip of theirs using the latest you know, TSMC process. So incredibly sophisticated, but more and more companies are doing this. Every automobile manufacturer has now announced that they're going to be designing their own chips because we've learned during the chip shortage that there are actually thousands of chips in an automobile. And if you can't have a supply of chips, you can't sell automobiles. And more and more companies are learning that the differentiating factor in their products are the chips. And if you're going to differentiate yourself from your competitor, you can't be using the same commodity chips that they use. You need to be designing your own special purpose chips. So that's one of the things that's happening. So this is electronics today. The leading edge factories, they call, call them fabs, cost about $20 billion to build one. So not many companies can do that. It's getting more and more difficult to make transistors smaller and smaller. But these application specific designs, you know, chips that are designed to do sp solve specific algorithms, do specific computations or AI tasks, they can achieve dramatic performance gains. So we can do that for a while. But that doesn't come for free. You know, think of how complex it is to design a chip with 67 billion transistors. This takes hundreds of engineers in some coordinated way in order to be able to do that. It can cost a half a billion dollars to design a chip. 
So that, that's getting very expensive also. But more and more, they're what differentiate one product from, from another, so they're getting more and more important. But there's also a lot of untapped potential at what we call the mature technology nodes. You know, the leading edge technology chips are needed for, you know, perform, uh, high performance computing, AI systems, uh, cloud computing servers and things like that. But many of the chips that we use in everyday life in our automobiles and appliances are the more mature nodes that are manufactured by a larger number of companies. And there's lots of opportunities for innovation there. So the big question these days is we've, we've developed this insatiable appetite for more and more computing, for more and more data, for more and more powerful electronic systems. We want to do more and more with artificial intelligence and data science. How are we going to improve the performance of electronic systems so that it can handle all of these things we want to do to make the world a better place. How are we going to do that if we can no longer just make transistors smaller and put more of them on a chip? That's the big question in the field today and that's why it's so exciting. So there's a 300 millimeter wafer in a single chip. As I mentioned, these chips are separated and then they're put in a package. And this is a really a low tech process um, it's labor intensive. Um, in the U.S., 98% of that business has been outsourced to other companies because countries because we just can't compete with that. Now, so you have an individual chip uh, in a package, and then you put it on a board, and you put several chips on. But every time you send an electronic signal from one chip to another, it consumes extra power and it introduces extra delays. So. It, you know, it, so that, that's why over the years you've tried to put as much of the electronic system as possible on the single chip. So we call it system on chip design. But we're reaching the limits. So one of the most ex promising avenues that people see for continuing to advance performance is something called advanced packaging. So an advanced package is almost as sophisticated as a chip manufacturing line itself. And in an advanced package, you'll have several different chips in such intimate contact, sometimes they're one chip placed on top of another, that they're in such intimate contact that it's almost as though you have one very large chip. And they can be a variety of different kinds of chips, so your entire electronic system can be put into one package. There are lots of advantage, dramatic performance advantages that you can obtain in these advanced packages. And a lot of the R&D effort in the U.S. And, and elsewhere in the CHIPS Act funding is devoted towards developing these technologies because we see it as a way to continue to advance electronic performance. So the big question is how long are we going to say Moore's Law is alive? How long are we going to draw pictures like this of number of transistors versus year? Probably for a very long time but we'll no longer call it number of transistors per chip, we'll call it number of transistors per package, and we'll continue to have more and more and more, and we'll probably get to a trillion transistors per package. All right, so that's the new era that's beginning. I think, you know, it's widely realized now just how important this technology is to every nation's defense and to their economic security. So there's a CHIPS Act here in India, there's one in Europe, there's one in the US, uh, Taiwan, Korea are investing, Japan is investing. Uh, they're absolutely critical. Uh, they're continuing to become more and more powerful, but they're becoming more and more differentiated. They're not no longer commodity products that everyone uses. So what, what's, what is the future going to look like? Well, there was a lot of innovation that occurred in the last 40 or 50 years. It wasn't easy to continue to make transistors smaller and smaller and smaller. It took a lot of innovation, but the innovation is going to become more diverse because people are going to be looking for many more ways to advance the performance of electronics. So the patient, uh, now also another challenge that the industry needs to face is this design challenge. When it costs a half a billion dollars to design a chip, there aren't many companies that can do that. So we need to dramatically lower the cost of design so that many more companies can be designing the electronics for their own products. So universities have an important role to play in this. 
uh, not just in training and developing the talent, the engineers that will do all of this work, but in the research and innovation that's needed in this whole new, uncharted, exciting era that we're entering in. So semiconductor technology is it's going to continue to be critical to our nations, never more so than now. Um, but it's going to provide exciting new career opportunities and research opportunities for young people. So it's an exciting new era. The future is bright for semiconductor technology. And uh, I think as someone who's spent almost 50 years in this field, I will tell young people there's never been a better time to get into this field. Exciting and important. All right, well, thank you. That's a little, I guess we're going to, we're going to continue with a few questions and bring my colleague up. Let's see. All right, um, so at this point, I'd like to introduce Professor Vijay Raghunathan. He's a professor and the associate head of the Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue University. In addition, he serves as the director of semiconductor education at Purdue, leading the university's efforts in semiconductors and microelectronics workforce development. He also leads the Embedded Systems and Internet of Things Lab at Purdue, working on hardware and software architectures for embedded systems, wearable and implantable electronics, and reliable secure systems design. Dr. Reganathan is a recipient of numerous awards and has chaired multiple premier conferences in his area. He also holds the Venki Harinarayan and Anand Rajaraman visiting chair at IIT Madras. So at this point, I'm going to kick off with one question, um, and then I'll take the mic. Um, wow. All right. That was unintentional, but there we are looking at semiconductors. <laughs> so um, Vijay, now you work more in chip design. So can you speak about the role of chip design in advancing semiconductor innovation? Thanks, Heidi. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, you know, speaking to all of you. Uh, I also you know, bring with me a message from your president. I spoke to him just before our trip, and he uh, conveys his greetings. He says, unfortunately, he wouldn't make this trip, but he says he will be on the next trip, uh, you know, and, and the next event. Uh, and uh, to, to, with that message, right, I'll get back to answering Heidi's question. Uh, so I, as she, Heidi mentioned, I work on the chip design side. And that, in a nutshell, is before these chips can be fabricated and manufactured with these tens of billions of transistors, somebody's got to figure out what to do with all these transistors, right? And how they can be organized and, and, and put together so they work in a coordinated manner to give us that great compute performance and enable all the wonderful things that software can then do on top of that. And that, in a nutshell, is what chip design is, right? And uh, the big challenge with chip design uh, is that it is so complex trying to design something with 67 billion things on it. Right? And I don't know any other system where we've been able to take 67 billion of anything and get them to work together in synchrony almost perfectly without you know, all fighting with, the, with each other, right? So it's a tremendous achievement in terms of taming the, this complexity beast and that's what designers do. Right? And there's a lot of help that they get from uh, very sophisticated tools uh, called electronic design automation tools uh, that really unleash the productivity of these designers by enabling them to manage all of this complexity. Right? Uh, so chip design is sort of the first stage in which we figure out what to get all of these transistors to do. And then the transistors are so small, and there's a lot of them. And the manufacturing and the fabrication side figures out how do we make this thing right, uh, in a reliable manner and, uh, and so that the physical thing that you produce is actually what you intended to produce in the first place. So that's Thank the value add of design. Thank you so much, Professor Raghunathan. Um, I'm just going to ask one other question to our keynote speaker, Professor Lindstrom, uh, because I would like to allow a little bit of time for the audience to ask their questions as well. Uh, so, Professor Lundstrom, I know you spoke a little bit about this. You touched upon it, but I'd like to hear a bit more, and I think the audience would like to hear a bit more, about Purdue's specific efforts in, in terms of developing a flagship workforce uh, in, in this area. Okay. 
So I'm happy to say a few words about that, although Vijay is actually the director of the program, but, but I, can, I can tell you about it. Uh, and uh, we, we've really made it a priority for the College of Education. So regaining, reshoring semiconductor manufacturing to the U.S., regaining our lead in the leading edge, uh, this, this is a high priority for the nation right now. Um, the year when President Chang was Dean Chang, he spent a year, 2020, as science advisor to the Secretary of State. And I think that experience helped him understand just how critical this technology is. He's not a semiconductor person, but it was, the, it was during the COVID, there were chip shortages, um, and he realized how critical this was to the nation's future. So when he came back as Dean of Engineering, he really committed Purdue College of Engineering as one of the nation's largest engineering program. How do we feel we have a responsibility to help the nation address this challenge. Now, we've been teaching semiconductor courses for years and years, but the new program is a much more coordinated, uh, comprehensive, college-wide effort. And the message that we're sending to students is, whatever your degree is a, a, in a STEM degree, you know, if you're an engineer of almost any kind, chemical, electrical, mechanical, uh, civil, building the factories, a materials engineer, if you're a computer scientist, if you're a data scientist, if you're an industrial engineer, if you're a chemist, if you're a physicist, there are exciting career opportunities for you in this field. So semiconductor engineering is an extremely broad field. So we've introduced a brand new course for first year students where they can become acquainted. So over the years, you know, none of us, except those of us working in the semiconductor industry, have really thought a lot about semiconductors. And students don't have a general, uh, haven't had a, a large awareness of semiconductors, microelectronics, career opportunities. There's so many other opportunities. But the first thing we wanted to do was to raise the awareness of students of the opportunities in this field. So we have a course where every year, every week, a company comes in, talks to the students about what the company does, what career opportunities there are for students, whatever their major is, uh, how the company with their work makes the world a better place. And we've been really pleasantly surprised by the level of interest among students. So students are hearing about chip shortages in semiconductors, and they're wondering what it's all about. So the enrollment of this class in our first offering is about 180 students, so it, it's surpassed expectations. We're following that up with a summer experience on campus where they can take one of two options. They can either learn how to design a chip or they can learn how to fabricate and make a chip. Uh, we had hoped to maybe have 50 students in the first offering of this coming up summer. And what did we have, 200? Over 200 students have registered for the course. That's actually more than we can handle. But it's an indication that you know students are interested in what this is all about, want to learn more about it, and are prepared to consider, consider becoming semiconductor engineers. So. Anything that you'd like to add to that? I'll keep it very short. I think uh, I firmly believe that as far as the, the, the supply chain in semiconductors is concerned, I think the most critical piece of the supply chain is that of human talent. Right? And I think Purdue's program is designed as we onshore and nearshore a lot of these factories and fabrication and manufacturing facilities produce program is intended to make sure that the supply chain of human talent is robust, uh, diverse, right, and strong. Thank you so much. All right, now I'd like to turn to the audience. Um, if you have a question, please just raise your hand and um, our colleague will come over with a microphone. Um, there's a question in the second row. Ashutosh Majmundar, I'm a chemical engineer, but uh, uh, this is very fascinating, of course. But I want to ask the question that uh, you said that only three countries have these technology, but where does China stand and where can India hope to stand in the next? Who would like to take that? So, uh, um, there are only three countries that are at this leading edge. And China is not, you know, China is not one of them. China would very much like to advance and be able to compete with these, with these uh, three companies. There's something, 
that, that tool that I showed you that produces these very small patterns that makes these very small transistors, there's only one country in the world that can manufacture that tool. It's made in the Netherlands. And China does not have access to that tool now. I'm sure there is a very large program underway in China to try to develop that technology. Uh, and eventually, they are likely to get there. But, but right now, so if you look in the US, over 90% of our leading edge chips come from one place. They come from this company TSMC in Taiwan. It's, it's not the safest place in the world. It's also on an earthquake zone. I think this is part of the concern that we have ab about, uh, about how fragile our supply chains are, how critically dependent we've come to rely on for these chips. Uh, and that's part of the motivation for bringing this back to the US. Now, my expectation is that the, is that the uh, activity in India will be focused more at the mature edge. Mm -hmm. There are also specialized chips that do you know, special applications, not, not the silicon chips that I talked about. Other semiconductors like gallium nitride, uh, three, five materials that do things like power electronics, the motor controls for electric vehicles. So there are, there are other important technologies, and I suspect that uh, India will not be focusing on trying to be, you know, to, to be the fourth major player in the leading edge. Do you, yeah. you agree? I, I completely agree. And you know, speaking to the, the, the government agencies that run India's semiconductor emission, I think they're not even trying to do that because they realize that I think the, the market for a lot of the, the strategic needs, the defense needs, the DRDO and, and, and the national uh, security needs are not really at that leading edge, but it is maybe a few technology generations behind. And so that's really that sweet spot that they're targeting. There's also a cost um, in an angle here, I think. If you look at the cost per transistor, you know, the, there's many estimates and there's you know, many ways in which people compute it, but a few generations behind the lead node, so about 28 nanometer, is what most people think is kind of a sweet spot in terms of cost per transistor. That's where the cost is minimal. And then after that, the cost per transistor starts going up, which is really why it takes, it's so expensive to make chips that are really at this leading edge. So there's also that um, angle which is playing a role, I think, in a lot of in thinking in India, strategically. Great, um, we'll have to take two more questions right here in the second row. And then I saw a hand back there. Yeah, so we'll the take. Row. Uh, actually, midway through the, yes. Okay, so I have two questions. The first one is, in the presentation, you mentioned something about mature technology. No? Can you explain a bit more about what it is exactly? I'm a little hearing challenge. So, Can you help? Oh, me? Sorry. You mentioned something called a mature technology node. What is that? Oh, well, so, so the, the, the leading edge is the latest technology that has just been put into manufacturing, right? And that today, this, we would call this five nanometer or three nanometer technology. The mature nodes are technologies, they were leading edge a few years ago, but now they continue to be produced and manufactured chips for other applications. So, you know, Vijay mentioned the, the most advanced technologies today we call, is it five or three? Three, maybe. Maybe three nanometers. Uh, he, he was talking about the sweet spot is maybe 28 nanometers. So these are much bigger transistors. But they, th th there's a whole variety of applications that they're very important for. So many, there are many factories that are building these mature technology nodes. Much less expensive, not $20 billion. So for example, just west of the Purdue campus, there's a, a company called Skywater that is building a chip factory to do one of these mature uh, node technologies. They're building a $2 billion factory. $2 billion is still a lot of money. But it's, it's one-tenth of what a leading edge factory is. Um, yeah, and then my second question was, um, so I'm, I'm going to be a computer science student. So I wanted to ask, what role would computer science play in the field of semiconductors? That's a good yeah. question for you. A, yeah, uh, you know, short answer, a tremendous role. <laughs> so in, in many different ways, because uh, certainly on the design side, um, I'm sure you've written, if you want to be a computer science student, you've written a lot of code, right? You've already, I'm sure, uh, got your hands dirty with programming. The way a lot of chip design today is done is it's also programming in many ways, right? Where you write a description of your chip in a different programming language, perhaps different from what uh, you've written 
you know, your software programs in. But at the end of the day, it is programming. And a lot of the principles that you will uh, learn in computer science really apply there as well. Uh, the second piece to that is these chips have gotten so complex that it's really beyond human capacity, I think, to manually reason about trying to connect 67 billion or even millions of these things together. So a lot of the design is done through the use of sophisticated uh, EDA tools or electronic design automation tools, CAD tools, um, and these are just extremely large sophisticated pieces of software and have incredibly powerful algorithms uh, underneath them and all of that stuff is really done by computer scientists. Right? So I think computer science will have a tremendous role to play, uh, especially as we see the growth of things like AI. Already a lot of the companies and a lot of the EDA tools are using AI in their, uh, in their EDA tools. Right? So exciting opportunities ahead. Yeah. So several companies recently shared with us their, their new college hiring data. They broke it down by chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, computer scientists. And you know there are different types of companies in the semiconductor industry, but companies that design the chips, the design companies, they hire a very high percentage of their new hires are computer science students. Excellent. I think it's is it Veranti yeah, Beck, one of our alums, and then we're going to have a very nice dinner reception, so there'll be plenty of time to speak casually and ask any questions that you might not have had the opportunity to to ask in this forum. Uh, Veranti. Good evening and thank you for coming here all the way to meet with us. And uh, a quick question I have here is, you know, back in 2001, there were about 17 chip fabs in the world. Today, we have maybe two and maybe a third one coming on board at some point in time. In the last three years, all of us professionally or personally have seen the challenges with the chip shortages. Uh, we probably couldn't uh, book our car that we wanted, okay, we couldn't get our phones on time. I know that in my company, we paid millions of dollars in trying to pay for premiums to get chips and still they weren't available. Um, and then, you know, we certainly see the birth of the Chips Act and then we see the semiconductor mission in India. But is it a little bit too late for governments to be waking up and trying to incentivize you know, increasing the capacity considering the rapid rate at which the adoption of uh, chips is, is taking place. Five years ago, my toaster didn't have a chip. Today it has a chip, you know. Now my toaster talks to my phone saying, hey, your toast is ready, <laughs> all right. So uh, I don't know if you can give some insight into uh, when do you think the situation will stabilize, you know, where I know TSMC is putting up a plant in Arizona and uh, so if we have supply and demand, you know, demand continues to grow, when will supply catch up? I mean, is there anything you can add on that? Yeah. Um, I, 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 can, I can speculate a little bit. When, when I talk to CEOs in the, in the semiconductor industry, there are, there are plans, there, TSMC is building a new plant, Intel is building a new plant, uh, their Micron is building a new plant. There are lots of factories that are being built right now. There's a feeling that there, might, that there might be a glut of chips temporarily when all of these new, new factories come online in three to four years or so. But if you look at the long-term projections, I think it's a, what is it, a $600 billion economy worldwide right now. By 2030, it's projected to be a trillion dollar economy. I think the feeling is that there might be a short-term surplus as all of these new factories come online, but that the, the, the demand is going to continue to grow for the next decades, one or two decades. The, the other comment I'll make is that, you know, I was, uh, I, I accompanied our governor on a state trip to Taiwan uh, last August, and the, the state is t encouraging Taiwanese companies to open factories in Indiana. But we met with a lot of CEOs of semiconductor companies, and, you know, these people are, are experts on manufacturing. And one of the messages that they sent to us is, this is going to be much more difficult than you think. And you know, getting to your point that, you know, is it too late? But they, but they told us that we're confident that you will eventually succeed because it is so critical to your, to your defense and to your economic security, you have to succeed. And I think 
I think every nation, I think India too, is recognizing how essential these are to your nation. And it's, so it, it's not too late. Uh, this is going to be a, a long-term need that we all face. And we have to roll up our sleeves and, and do the work and get it done. Thank you. It's now or never. <laughs> right, and that's all I'll say about it. <laughs> well, nice note to end on.